Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Laura Talks. Um, thank you to all of the new subscribers. I'm so happy you're here. Um, for those of you who are new, I'm Laura, and I created this channel to talk about books that I like. Um, back during the break, I was doing one one video per day. Now that I'm at school, um, it's going to be less frequent. I'm going to try to do one um, video a week, but no promises because my education does come first. But this week, um, I recently finished an amazing book. It was a gift from my sister a couple Christmases ago, and it's taken me a while to read it. I started it, um, well, she gave it to me about two years ago, and I started it, like, shortly after, and then I only got a little bit through, and then I quit, but then I came back to it, and it's taken me, this read-through took me probably eight months, um, but don't let that color your view of the book. Um, I have a theory as to why it took me so long to read it, and I'll explain that theory in a bit. First, the book is In the Garden of Iden by Cage Baker. There you can see the cover with its amazing artwork. There's a stained glass window, a cyborg, a clock um, by Cage Baker. This is the first book of hers that I've read, but it's really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, and so also most of my videos, I try not to go too much into spoilers, but I've just, I've been thinking about this book so much since I finished it that I really want to talk about the ending. So I'm going to do my best to talk about the book from beginning to end. So that means the further you go in this video, the more likely you are to come across spoilers. So just keep that in mind as you're watching. Um, so the premise of the book is that there is a company um, ran by some people called Dr. Zeus. Yes, that's actually what they're called. And they invented this company to... Um, I don't know if they invented it to preserve history or if that was just kind of a side effect along the way. But um, they invented immortality. And then to test the immortality, they invented time travel, and they went back in time, made someone immortal, came forward in time to their time, and see if it worked. And it did, but there were side effects, obviously. So there was trial and error, and they tried to figure it out, and they did. Um, and this is all told to us from the perspective of our narrator, who is also a character, and she's narrating um, kind of her life and experience, um, at least through her first mission, um, and so she's the one that tells us this history, um, she doesn't know her actual name, but she calls herself Mendoza, and uh, I have a lot of thoughts about her, but, um, is she a reliable narrator? I don't know. Um, but I think we can trust the history of the company. Um, so eventually, once they get um, immortality figured out, they realize that it takes a certain type of person to become immortal. And um, it works better if you take them from when they're children. So... They have operatives, they go back like a long, long time, and they have, they find children, and they make them immortal, and they teach them and train them, and at some point they realize that they can use this to preserve history, like plants that have gone extinct, and um, paintings that burned, or books that burned, um, animals that go extinct, that sort of thing. They can take DNA and gather samples and they could preserve them for the future. And so they start doing that. And eventually they have like operatives all throughout time that are also constantly making more operatives. And one of those is Mendoza. And the person that rescues her, I believe his name is, yeah, his name is Joseph. 
and this happens in the early 1500s. I don't remember the exact year, but I think it's the 1540s. So Mendoza is a red-headed Spaniard, and she, her mother had, um, had a lot of kids, so she might not have even been named in the first place. Um, but uh, some people come along to her mother when she's like four or five, and they say, we need a servant. Would you be willing to sell us one of your kids? And of course, this is during the time period where, um, you know, um, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this because as far as I can tell, it's historically accurate. Um, but it's during one of the time periods, that's a better phrasing, it's during one of the time periods where the governments in Europe are trying to snuff out Jews and anyone who is hiding Jews and anyone who's a secret Jew. And, um, because obviously everyone has to be the government sponsored religion because that's the best way to make a nation. Um, anyways not here for politics, um, but there's a little bit of back and forth between Mendoza's mom and these ladies, and eventually, uh, she does, um, go with the people, and, you know, I, I was thinking, like, oh, these people, they seem a little weird to be the company, but also don't really know much about the company yet, let's just go with it, and, um, some... I think they might have been smugglers of some sort, maybe human traffickers, but they definitely were not with the company, and they were not the who they told Mendoza's mother they are. So eventually, um, some people come to where they're staying, and Mendoza freaks out, and she's like, she's a witch, and I think, and, um, Basically, she gets brought to the dungeons, and the, this is, I think, during the Spanish Inquisition period, so there's, you know, the Inquisitor, and um, the lady claims that she's Mendoza's mother, but she's not, and Mendoza tries to tell the priest that, and, um, you know, she's this four- or five-year-old child sitting in jail thinking, oh, my actual mom will be here soon, you know, um, my mom wouldn't let me just sit in jail, but, uh, her mom probably doesn't even know, which is really sad, um, and so, um, you know, she is questioned, and then held without food or water, and then she's questioned again, and, you know, it's all about, are you a secret Jew, um, you know, we have your mother, and Mendoza's like, no, that's not my mother, and the priest says, but she says she is, and there's a lot of back and forth, but, it, and it's very traumatizing, traumatizing for young Mendoza, obviously. Eventually, she is rescued by, I, be, I believe his name is Joseph, who is an operative of the company, working undercover, as an inquisitor, and he rescues her, and he, with her consent, and he says, and he takes her back to a base, where, um, uh, sorry about that, uh, he takes her back to a base, a company base, where they start the process of making her immortal, which, um, is a slow process. It takes 10, 12 years of, you know, slowly, um, replacing parts with mechanical parts and, um, also training her and indoctrinating her in the company ways, because obviously if you have these immortal operatives, you want them to stay loyal to the company as long as possible, if not forever. So, and there is some actual programming in there as well, which we find out later on. Um, they can't, um, 
I don't know where I was going with that. Anyways, um, she gets trained, and she decides she wants to become a botanist. She wants to go to the new world, and she wants to study all of the, um, all of the plants that are there, and she thinks that's how she can definitely help the company, um, and part, going back to the indoctrination bit for a bit, part of that indoctrination is that, um, as an operative of the company, you're better than the mortals, because the mortals rely on their emotions, and, um, blah, 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 and, you know, they cannot be trusted, and you're never, don't get too close to them, and, you know, so on and so forth, but, um, and she is fully entrenched in that, and when she gets her first assignment, it's actually playing, she's 18-ish at the time, and her role is a Spaniard, the daughter of a Spanish doctor, um, who are going to England, and they're going to, um, they're going to this man's estate who has collected rarities, and that's his whole life. His whole life's goal has been around collecting these rarities, and, um, part of that is a very rare plant that goes extinct soon after, but it has pro valuable properties for medicine, which will be useful in the future. So they need to collect samples of it throughout its entire growth cycle. Um, and obviously she's not thrilled about this because of her experiences with the Spanish Inquisition um, and, you know, the English at this time period aren't getting really getting along with the Spaniards. Um, as a side note, you're like, well, you might have asked, well, there's time travel, but don't they worry about changing time? And the answer we're given is that you can't change the big events. So, like, who the King of England or Queen of England marries does not change. Um, but the minor details may change. Um, and so... Oh. So, yeah, um, so she's being sent there with two operatives. One of them is Joseph, the man who took her out of the, um, Inquisition dungeons. And another one, her name is Nefer, and she is an, I don't think anthropologist. Uh, she studies animals. She really, I think specifically farm animals, but, um, it could also be any animal. So, and the, the place they're going is the home of Sir Walter Iden, hence the name of the book, In the Garden of Iden. Um, and at this time, you know, every it's predominantly Catholic, but there's not, it's before the um, no Protestants allowed thing. Like, it's still taboo to be Protestant. But, um, obviously they exist. And, um, but, uh, you know, they travel there and they get to his estate. And obviously the staff aren't thrilled to have Spaniards there. Um, but... They try, they do their best to ingratiate themselves, and obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but Mendoza is kind of freaking out because she is surrounded by mortals, and she, she's using the tools in her brain to, like, you know, diagnose everything, and, oh, this man has this thing wrong, and what if it starts hurting him, and what if he starts murdering people, and she's just spiraling out of control, and then Nefer who is an experienced, more experienced operative, is just like, that stuff doesn't really actually happen. It's all very exaggerated. Um, and so, she calms down a little bit, but the, it's kind of,
kind of a butler, but he's mostly the person that takes people on tours around the garden. His name is Nicholas Harpole, and he is a Protestant slash Lutheran. I'm, it might have been explicitly stated, and I probably just missed it, but he's not Catholic. Um, and I think he was part of, like, a weird sex cult in the Protestants. It's, that part of the story is a little bit fuzzy in my mind, but it's, it's interesting. Um, and, you know, he seems to be the most suspicious of them. So, Joseph is like, he's like the team lead, and he says, you know, Mendoza, you're a pretty young girl. You couldn't get him to fall in love with you. And Mendoza at first is like, mm, no, I don't want to do that. He is immortal, and he doesn't even like me. But then Joseph points out that Nicholas could jeopardize the mission um, if something were to happen. And so Mendoza re- reluctantly agrees, and she gets Nicholas to take her on a stroll, like a walk through the garden um, alone. Just the two of them. And... Long story short, they do end up falling in love, and he tries to convert her to his religion, and she realizes that he has a lot of company virtues, and, you know, um, the pre- they're making Sir Walter Iden young again as, like, payment for letting them use his garden and so she asked Joseph couldn't you just do that to him couldn't you extend his life a little bit and Joseph says no that's not the mission plus you know um these things, he's gonna die eventually anyways um and it comes up um that like it is allowed to like operatives are allowed to marry mortals if it's like in the company's best interest but there's a lot of paperwork and stuff. Um, and um, so at first, the relationship between Mendoza and Nicholas is on the appropriate side. Um, and then it turns out that um, the thing about never getting close to mortals and, you know, being in a relationship with mortals and doing adult things with mortals, yes, that's a hard company rule, but no one really follows it. So she and Nicholas do end up doing the dirty dance quite a few times, and she and they both end up falling deeply in love and it was probably at that point that I should have realized that this book is actually a tragedy um that honestly the whole story kind of has the tone of a tragedy and I just I never realized it because I was so focused on like this um science fiction aspects and you know these are immortal cyborgs And I think that might have been part of why I found it a little boring and I couldn't really, like, I didn't read through it quickly was because it has this tone of tragedy and I didn't pick up on that. And I'm like, this, if you don't realize something is a tragedy, it kind of makes you it's hard to explain, but, um, yeah, this, it takes, it took me a while to realize it. It took me too long to realize it, but this book is a tragedy, um, but it's very good. So, closer to the end of their stay there, uh, Sir Walter Iden is, you know, feeling better, and he decides to sell his estate. And this is before the time frame 
that um, they're supposed to leave. So obviously Joseph and Naffer and Mendoza are all kind of freaking out. Like, we can't leave yet. You know, we have a job to do. And they try and talk to Walter and the guy who is um, buying it. And this is, I believe the year is 1555. And around this time period, there's like a hard, there's a law put in place that you have to go to mass. If you're not seen at mass every single week, there will be consequences. And they start burning heretics at the stake and having executions, um, which is very worse, worrisome for our Nicholas Harpole. Well, he's not worried. But Mendoza is worried, um, and, um, there, this is the part that I remember the most, because I've read it the most, so I'm going to, uh, go into a little bit of detail right now, so if you're really worried about spoilers, I would say stop the video now, go read the book. So, um, one day, Nicholas is cataloging items in, uh, the, in a bookcase type thing, and it's apparently religious relics, you know, a fingernail and tooth of, um, saints, um, but Walter and the guy who is spying his estate come in and um there's a debate about a sword so walter climbs up on top of the bookcase and grabs the sword but ends up dropping it and then one thing leads to another and it falls over on top of joseph which this is a heavy solid case it would have killed any normal person but because of um because he's a cyborg, you know, he does some stuff to mitigate the damage, but he still ends up tearing his shoulder, um, and he ends up being, like, mostly fine, but he still has to have his arm in a sling. So, um, that night, Mendoza and Nicholas are talking, and they had talked before about running away and eloping, um, so Mendoza kind of brings the idea up again, and she's like, you know, we're going to be leaving soon. We're going to go somewhere that would be safer for you. You should come with us. And then you could be safe too. And Nicholas says, no, I can't. That would be against my religious duty. Um, and they talk for a bit. And then um, they fall asleep. And Mendoza has a nightmare about being in the uh, dungeons. And so she wakes up, wakes up terrified, and Nicholas says, I think to himself, I'll go down to the doctor to get something to calm her down. You know, the doctor would have medicine. Um, unfortunately, Joseph has opened him his shoulder up to try and do some self-repair on his muscles, and he's doing a chant from a long time ago in a language that doesn't exist anymore because that helps calm him down. So when Nicholas opens the door, he sees the shoulder wound open and this man chanting and he obviously freaks out because, yeah, I would freak out too. Um, so then he runs back up, but he... Um, he scares Mendoza, and, um, I think, this part, like, I read it multiple times, and it's still, so he comes for Mendoza, and she's scared and teleports away, because they do have some short space teleportation, and then he thinks that she is also possessed and so there's, like, a little bit of a chase around the room with her teleporting and him trying to grab her. And eventually she teleports onto the ceiling. And they have this really heartfelt discussion. Well, discussion. It's actually kind of short. 
Um, but he, you know, he has the sword, he grabs a sword to protect himself. And, you know, that breaks her heart because she would never hurt him. She's in love with him, you know, if she could just explain it to him, but he doesn't give her that chance. Um, and when he comes out of the room, um, Nefer comes out and uh, she holds like a candelabra towards him and she's like, go away, spirit. So um, instead of instead of people thinking that Mendoza and Joseph are possessed by devils, um, they think that Nicholas was because um, they knew that he was a Lutheran or Protestant and they, you know, they had burned his books, but, you know, obviously he was like possessed by the devil or something. So he runs away. Um, and Mendoza keeps, you know, doing her, you know, um, well, now that, well, they saw, the whole household saw Mendoza also come out of Nicholas's room, so now they know, so, you know, she has to pretend to do penance in the garden, which actually kind of works out, because that's where her work is, but, um, she ends up hearing uh, that Nicholas was preaching in a town, and, is now sentenced to be burned at the stake as a heretic. So obviously she makes the completely rational choice, which I I don't blame her for this choice, uh, but she decides to walk all the way to that town. She does exactly zero thinking about this plan until she's already like halfway there. Uh, she does come across a person who tried to follow her, but she escaped. Um, and so she gets to the town, and she finds out that he's not sentenced to be burned until tomorrow. So she find, she finds the mayor, and she convinces him to let her talk to Nicholas because, you know, they have some feelings for each other, and she's been trying to save his soul, and doesn't he deserve one last chance to for his soul to be saved? And they're like, well, yeah, he probably does. So they let her in to talk to him. And the sad thing is, maybe if she hadn't gone there, he would have repented. repented um, because he admits that seeing her hardened his resolve. Um... So, they have a conversation, and um, Nicholas is like, you know, you're a spirit, you're just trying to tempt me, blah, 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 and Mendoza is like, no, and she tries to do some explaining, but then Joseph shows up, because obviously, you can't have a rogue operative, and he's in charge, so this will go badly for him, so he rides all the way up there. And um, charges into the prison cell and um, he punches Nicholas and then it's very dramatic and they have some words. And um, then he tries to talk Mendoza, he tries to convince her to go home because obviously she shouldn't see the man that she loves be burned to death. But she's convinced that he's going to recant, which is why he wanted, Nicholas wanted her to stay. So they end up staying, and Mendoza just watches in horror as, you know, he, Nicholas is given a chance to recant, and he doesn't. He instead doubles down and preaches about the sin of silence, and um, then he's lit on fire, and he reaches out through the fire to her, and he says, join me, spirit, thou hast free will, and 
the thing that gets me is that she would have joined him. She tried to join him, but the programming in her mind wouldn't let her. And that's just... There's so many layers to this tragedy, and he literally died trying to save her soul, and she would have died with him. She would have given up her soul for him, and there's just so many layers, and it's so insane, but also so amazing, and it's just so good. And obviously, she is traumatized by this because she just watched the man that she loves be burnt to death. And yes, he would have died anyways. But. And. It gets you thinking about, well, it got me thinking about cause and effect. Because if. The company had sent a different botanist, or if Mendoza hadn't been saved, Nicholas might still be alive. You know, the reason he left Sir Walter's house and went off on his preaching spree was because he freaked out about seeing Mendoza teleport, which, like, yeah, that's freaky, that's scary, I get it. But also, then they wouldn't have met, and there's also, there was a point before this where Mendoza talked to Joseph about trying to get, like, a Romeo and Juliet drug, which is so... Mm. That was an amazing choice on Cage Baker's part because it's been a while since I've read Romeo and Juliet. Actually, I think was I think Romeo did die. I think yeah. Juliet faked her death, Romeo actually died, and Juliet actually died. And Mendoza would have died if she could have. And she clearly never gets over this. And because, you know, she goes to therapy and she's supposedly fixed. Um, But here she is in the future recalling her first mission. And this clearly... She... She clearly still feels things about what happened, and how could she not? The first person she ever fell in love with got burned at the stake in front of her. That is insane. Like, can you imagine? And it's just, I I had so many thoughts about this book, and I'm trying to remember them because, you know, when you're not recording, it's easier to be, you know, to sound more intelligent and fancy and whatever with your thoughts, and, um, but... Yeah... It it had an interesting ending, to be sure, but I highly recommend it. If you like history and fiction, um, I'm not a history buff, but the history dates sounded accurate to me, so um, it's an excellent excellent mixture of science fiction and history and romance and tragedy and it is all those things at the same time and yes it is a tragedy but the love was there and it matters that the love was there 
because how could it not matter that the love was there? <sighs> yeah, I'm, this book is definitely a keeper. Okay, now that I've gotten that out of my system, um, my sister does still need help. Um, if you're new, I started a GoFundMe to help her in November after she broke her back falling off of a horse in late October of last year. Um, She's had struggle with work. Her boyfriend has had struggle for work. Obviously, she wasn't allowed to work for a while. And but now she was supposed to start her job, but they had given her classroom away. So they're going to struggle to pay rent for February. So if you can spare anything, please, please do donate. Even five, ten dollars I promise it helps. If you don't want to give through GoFundMe, because they do take a small portion. Her Venmo is in the GoFundMe. You just got to scroll down and look for it. Um, please, I would be so grateful and she would be so grateful if you could help out. And if you can't donate, I totally understand but please share the link. You have permission to share it on any and all social media. Um, She could really use your help. Um, Thank you, and I will talk to you later.